Um, yes, as Scotty says, I'm, I'm representing Coastwatch, which you'll see number three on the list there is also Coastbusters Research Group. <laughs> we ain't afraid of no coast. So that's um, a little research group formed by Alan Smith, who happens to be my husband. <laughs> okay, so that's my co-author. Um, and Alan is, is also um, a research associate of the School of Ge Geosciences at UKZN. Okay, so just to give a little bit, bit of background on who Coastwatch are. So we're an NGO, non-government organisation, formed in 1998. And our main function is as an environmental watchdog and commenting body on matters concerning conservation, management and sustainable developments within the coastal zone. So I've highlighted coastal zone although, of KZN, although we all are also concerned about the offshore marine resources. And our focus is on the coast. Um, basically, we have quarterly meetings and a lot of email communication and banter that goes on between our members. And the important thing for you all to know is that we're all volunteers. So we're all um, giving our free time. There is a Facebook site, if anyone wants to write that down, and it's, it's quite active with different little, little posts on it. Okay, so one of our concerns from Coastwatch is what effect do modifications in river catchments have on our beaches? So, but in order to understand that, I need to just take you through what the sources of beach sediments are. So the major source, obviously fluvial, um, a lot of beach silt and sand coming down, so different sediments, different um, millimetres, so different size fractions of sediments that, that get brought down. Um, and it's important to know that, that the, the larger fractions are the ones that are coming through and um, getting deposited on our beaches. Um, there's cliff erosion, so you'll see on the bottom there, cliff erosion, and there's some beaches in the background. Um, Biogenic shell fragments getting broken up, resulting in sand, and then you've got windblown sand. So there's uh, exchange between dunes and the beach, and that's that's quite important for um, maintaining beaches. If you think of the example of um, Jeffreys Bay, St Francis, where you've got a place that that used to be called Bruce's Beauties, and by changing the um, by a lot of roycrons getting, getting planted there, it actually stopped the dune sort of exchange between the beach and the dunes and resulted in, in rocks, a more sort of a rocky environment, and the surf break didn't break as well as it used to. Okay, factors affecting beach sediment supply. Um, we've got anthropogenic, so different farming practices, reforestation, taking out natural grasslands, anything that's gonna, gonna impact. Um, and then that's, that's going to come through to your runoff. Land clearing, so I've included land clearing and, and development. Dams, obviously dams affecting your sediment supply, acting as a sediment trap, resulting in less sediment getting onto the beaches. And then the bug, big bug bear, sand mining. Some of it's legal, most of it's illegal. Um, and then naturally, we have climate and we have wet and dry cycles. Um, and I put climate change under natural. It can, you can argue that it could be anthropogenic, but if you look at the geological history, climate change has been happening for millions, but almost billions, billions of years. Um, we, anthropogenic effects might be exacerbating it, but it is a natural occurrence. It would be happening anyway. It might be slightly accelerated. Okay, so I'm gonna just uh, present some flow statistics. These are from uh, Department of Water Affairs monthly records. I think their name has now changed to something else. I can, I can never keep up, it's Dwa or something. <laughs> um, so there's a few catchments. Tugela River in the north, Mgeni River at Durban, and then Umkamas, Umkamasi River down at the bottom in the south. And I've just given a little swell rose over here. Um, just because that's an influence on what your longshore drift is doing. So most of, most of our Swells are coming up from the south southeast, so our longshore drift is going from south to north. That longshore drift is then transporting your sediments in that direction northward. Okay, so just a couple of uh, mean annual flows from Kamas. Um, you can see here there's a slow downward trend. So we're starting at 1960, going through to current current year. And you can see there's this, this slow little downward trend, and you'll see a couple of spikes here. 1987 floods being 
the big outlier. Okay, then you look at the Amgeni, similar thing, but the curve is a little bit steeper. Okay, again, 1987 coming out prominently. So, fairly consistent. Also, when you look at Tugela, or Tukela, as it's now called, further in the north. And so, it depends on the argument. Is that long term trend? Is it related to climate change, or we're we just in different cycles? Um, unfortunately, in this case, you can see there's a bit of a few data gaps in the, the water affairs records, which, which affects the data quality. But nonetheless, there is still this consistent downward trend. So, the question is. Are the modifications, whether they're anthropogenic or natural, affecting beach sediment supply? So, in 2008, Andre Teron from CSR did a study um, for, on behalf of Etiqueni, and he found that a th almost a third of the sediment coming down to the beaches was reduced by dams. And then he went on to look at sand mining and found that there's another third. So that leaves us with two-thirds sediment loss coming down. So, um, just to take you through another bit of statistics, also, also through Etiquani Municipality and, and Portnet, well, now Transnet, um, this has produced the figures from Andrew Mather, who's co-author in one of our papers. Um, it's the sand trap, which in Durban, this is the bluff in Durban, that's Durban Harbour. The sand trap is this little area here where you see the wave breaking. And it's where the sand is naturally brought by the longshore drift, but then the supply to the north is interrupted by the harbour. So you can see your, your different piers, the south pier mostly, that's, that's trapping it. So that trap is used to collect sand to then replenish the Durban beaches. So you've got a dredger that operates, dredges the sand, it's either put into um, a system where it's, where it's pumped onto the beaches or it's dumped offshore, off what they call the mound. So you can see there's a variability. Now this, this is used as a proxy. So, the sand trap is harnessed when the dredger is available and it's used to, to re-nourish the beaches. But there is a variability within this as well because they, they can only dredge what's available. So, if there's not, no sand available, they can't operate. So, you'll see that obviously there are fluctuations from year to year, but there is still a general downward trend. So, yes, there is a sediment loss coming down because it's, that sand trap isn't really, you know, reflecting an increase at all, it's just, it's not static, it's, there's a general loss. So less water, or less rainfall, um, and less sediment coming down the beaches because of interruptions might be bringing less sand down. But now we've got to say, well, is this actually affecting us? What about the long-term trends here? So, in Umgeni Mouth, we've got, I've just got a figure here from 1931 and 2013. Um, the Mgeni River at this stage was discharging northward um, through beechwood mangroves. But you can see here, there's a little line here that has the, an old shooting range which was washed away in the 1987 floods. It's been georeferenced and it's put in here for your, for your reference. But you can see, with all this, you know, we should be getting less sand, dams are interrupting. Are we actually getting, is it all reflected in all the beaches? Not necessarily so. It's, act, it's actually been quite stable. But within that time, we've had an envelope of mobility of 120 meters that's been measured by um, Andy Cooper in 1991. So there, are, there is variation within this. Um, now to just go further north, it's to get a mouth, what's happening at the moment. Um, I've shown an image, February 2006. It's a Google image. You can see where the coastline was. And now we're in a very erosive state. So over the last two years, the beach is just melting away. There isn't any sediment. So this black line here is reflecting the same line here. And there's 150 meters of beach loss. So this, this picture is May 2015. Even since then, there's been erosion up to the, the little huts, which I'll show you the pictures of now. So this is to get a mouth. Um, 21st of December, launch site closed. No launching anymore. Too steep a bank. And this is a similar angle looking from the mouth, looking northwards, and you can see there's little, little picnic huts and playground has now been totally impacted. Although since then, you'll see there has been some sand replacement coming through in, in October, uh, later in this month, as we're starting to get to a more summer, summer cycle again. 
Okay. Um, the next thing to do is you've got to look at cycles. So beach erosion happens in a different, different cycles. There's a thing called the lunar nodal cycle, and that affects sediment availability. So what I've done here is I've given that same graph um, of, the, of the dredge um, volumes, and the black lines is the dredge volumes, but it's on the years that coincide with the lunar nodal cycle. So what is a lunar, lunar nodal cycle, you might all be asking? That's when the moon is closer to the Earth, basically. It's, in, it's, in, it's when the gravitational pull is the most. So it occurs in an 18.6-year cycle. Within that cycle, there's little subharmonics that happen in 4.4 4 years and 9 years. And this, basically, you've got more gravitational pull. This also affects your erosion. It's tidal currents and it's erosion. And during those periods, you also have um, sometimes greater wave events. So you can see that there is a trend during the lunar nodal cycle. There's been a sort of downward trend in the volumes available. It's, it's sort of overlapping. So here there's been a lot of sediment available. During the lunar nodal cycle, less sediments available. So there is a cyclicity. Now to get a little bit more complicated, um, and the little the graph, the figures at the bottom don't really show up because the screen is cutting things short a bit. Um, but you wouldn't be able to see them anyway because they're too small. But anyway, here we've got, this is the lunar nodal cycle here. So it's every 18.6 years, right? Going up and down. In between, in the, this is from 1950 through to 2010. Um, in between here, the gray areas, the shaded areas, are those times where we've had a lot of erosion on the beaches. Okay, so you can see that there is a relationship. When you've got this lunar nodal cycle at an up, and up over here, and up over here, there's been a general agreement that the beaches along our coast have been more eros erosive. Now, we're superimposing the mean annual precipitation cycle, okay, which also happens on 18.6 years, about. It's called a Dyer, Dyer, they call it the Dyer Tyson cycle. Um, and in this, sometimes that is out of phase. So it stands to reason, when you've got a lot more um, rainfall coming down, and there will be time lags with how it's getting deposited on the beach, but when you've got more rainfall, you don't have erosion. You've got more sediment coming down to the beach. Okay? In some of these areas here, you've got less rainfall, less rainfall, less rainfall, less rainfall here, and you have had more erosion. So there's a link. It's not always, sometimes it's in a phase, sometimes it's out of phase. Obviously, we need more of a climatic record because we can only go back to 1930. The next graph is going to confuse people even more. <laughs> okay. um, basically, this graph is Rian Boertis, who's just finished his PhD, looking at um, different cycles in, in flood cycles. But he's basically superimposed. This is the coral record in the brown here. This goes from, you probably won't be able to see the figures, but it's from 1880 through to the present. And unfortunately, Rian couldn't get the 2,000 data plus from Weather SA because they were going to charge him a fortune, like half a million rand. So his study only unfortunately went up to 2,000. But basically what you can see is during periods, this, the green bars are when there's been extreme regional storm events. Okay? So you can see the coral record from this, the brown um, bars is the coral record showing when there was more mud in the coral. So you take the core down and you can date that back and you can see when there's more mud. Sediments, fine, those will be fines getting into the coral record. So you can see that, see that over the long term there is an agreement and there have been cycles in the past of more deposition during diatarsan cycles when there's been more rainfall. So on, on the flip side, if we're getting less rain, we are getting less sediment down. So this, during this period, with the, the sand trap, the dredge data has been maintained, but then it also dropped down. The graph at the bottom basically just shows variability. It's, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. It's a standard deviation indication, but it's also showing that, that the variability in our wet and dry periods. Um, just to put you into context, lastly, with the KZN drought, where we are now, um, We've just come out, well, 2015 was a more erosive year, 
and at the moment there's not too much sediment coming down. So the graphs here, and this is from the DWEF website, you can see the bottom graph, 2015, you've got um, average monthly rainfall, where we are at the moment, and you've got actual rainfall, 2014, 2015. Um, but you can see here's normal, the green over here, above normal would be the light blue, below normal. So you can see that at the moment things are getting progressively worse, which should mean less sediment coming through. So just some important con considerations is that the erosion cycles are linked to the lunar nodal cycle, but also rainfall, which is linked to the Pacific de Decadal Oscillation. Now, the Pacific de Decadal Oscillation, I might have uh, not mentioned it, but um, that's a warming of the ocean. So it's in the sea surface temperature, there are decadal oscillations. The Pacific Ocean is actually connected to the Indian Ocean. So that, that, and that affects the rainfall. So warmer temperatures will mean greater rainfall. The coast should be getting reduced sediment cycle supply, but evidence on our beaches over the long term suggests there are cycles of recession and progradation with little net loss. There are multi-decadal and interannual climatic cycles that affect the supply. It's important to consider seasonal and synoptic cycles. I haven't even gone to the seasonal and synoptic cycles. So by synoptic cycles, I'm meaning the day-to-day -day variability. So as your cold fronts are coming through, is it eroding, is it depositing? Because the, the beaches along our coast are very dynamic and can change from day to day. Seasonal, there's um, a beach rotation, which I won't even get, get, get into, but that's, it, it does make quite a difference as well. So sometimes on a seasonal basis and even on a synoptic basis, you can have more dynamic change than over interannual climatic cycles. Other sources, so apart from river, river runoff, we need to consider that there are offshore sandbars and longshore drift, and these are maintaining our coast in the long term. But is this going to last forever? So, with that in mind, we need to consider off-stream dams and stricter sta sand mining control to reduce the impacts to the river systems and prevent future coastal er erosion and basically maintain our sediment supply. So, properly functioning rivers are important to maintain a regular sand supply to the coast. And thank you.